Good morning, everyone. I'm Linda, and I'm bringing the Word of God to you today. Reading is from Luke 14, verses 1 to 11. Jesus at a Pharisee's house. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the Lord, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So, taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least the seat of least importance. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Exactly 160 years ago, on the first three days of July in 1863, a great battle raged near the town of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> it involved the most number of casualties of any engagement in the American Civil War and is often cited as the turning point in that war. Now, four months later, in the middle of November, the war cemetery at Gettysburg was to be dedicated and the keynote speaker for the event was a man named Edward Everett. <coughs> this, um, he was renowned as the greatest orator in the country at that time. A very impressive man. He'd been a former Secretary of State, a position that we would call Foreign Minister. He'd also been a Congressman and briefly a Senator. He'd been the Governor of Massachusetts, the President of Harvard University, an ambassador to Great Britain, a Unitarian pastor, and just three years earlier, a vice presidential candidate. He worked on his speech for three months and reportedly predicted that his speech at Gettysburg would be known as one of the greatest orations in all of human history. He began, standing beneath this serene sky, it is with hesitation that I raise my poor voice to break the eloquent silence of God and nature. You've probably never heard those words before. And without notes and with great grand gestures, he spoke for over two hours. Not uncommon in those days. Meanwhile, in the crowd was President Abraham Lincoln. He wasn't even on the invite list until two weeks before the event when somebody realised the omission and invited him. He wasn't expected to attend, but when he agreed, he was told he could say a few closing words. When the ceremony was about to conclude, he moved up to the podium. Now remember, he'd only had two weeks to prepare and in fact he had a busy job at the time during a time of war and he'd written some notes on the back of an envelope on the train journey the afternoon before. And he pulled out the envelope and he began. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. You may have heard those words before. On this day, he wasn't well. He spoke slowly. He had no grand gestures. He probably didn't even look up from the podium, uh, one report says. 
His whole speech was over in two minutes. He concluded, the great task remaining before us, that from these honoured dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from this earth. Now, there's not very many school children in America that know about proud Edward Everett. But I can tell you that they all learned this speech from Abraham Lincoln. And our passage today is a lesson that Jesus taught about arrogance and humility. To cut a very long story short, we can sum up today's sermon from Proverbs 15.33, which says in part, humility comes before honour. In God's kingdom, the way up begins by going low. It's a privilege to be asked to have the pulpit this morning. And uh, Aidan didn't want me to continue on in John's Gospel. He's going to do that later on. So I'm reprising our series on people Jesus met this morning that we were doing last year. And today we see Jesus in the presence of some Pharisees who are jostling for honour. He talks to them about humility. And so this morning we want to try and understand what it is that Jesus said and to see if there's something that we can learn and apply to our lives this week. Let's get started. One Sabbath, Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee. He was being carefully watched. Well, this is a prominent Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees. And a lot of his mates were Pharisees, so there was quite a few Pharisees present at this uh, event. And Jesus was being scrutinised. He'd performed a lot of miracles. He was well known. That's why the Pharisees wanted him. He was a, a good guy to have around. He was an interesting character but they were very concerned about him and they were watching carefully to see if he'd slip up. And in full view of these people who were critically watching him, Jesus found there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of the body. This is probably a condition known as dropsy. It's a kidney dysfunction that causes swelling in the limbs. It's a very painful condition to have. Jesus looked straight at these Pharisees and the experts in the law and said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He didn't beat around the bush. He knew they were watching. Plenty of times Jesus had put this question to the Pharisees on different occasions. And they refused to answer. Implicitly they were saying, no, you shouldn't do this. But they knew the right answer was yes. They just didn't like the consequences of the right answer. You see, the Pharisees were sticklers for sticking to the law. They had discerned 613 different laws in the Old Testament. And they had a whole bunch of extra laws, which they called the Mishnah, that hedged around the, the possibility of ever sinning, of ever getting close to breaking the law. As one example, they had a lot of rules around the Sabbath and what it meant to work. There were 39 different definitions of work in the Mishnah and lots of subcategories under that. So hundreds of rules around what constituted work. One example is they had a limit on the number of steps they could take on a Sabbath day. That just meant you lay around the house mostly. But if you had to go and visit your aunt, aunt you had to count your steps to make sure you didn't go over the limit. They didn't have Fitbits in those days. You could write a letter to a friend on the Sabbath, but if you wrote lots of letters, that was a chore and that was work. So there were limits on that as well. Now this system led to a very heartless, cold and arrogant brand of righteousness. It was a flawed system. They confused personal preferences with divine law. 
They had to come up with new laws for new situations. In the end, it reduced a person's ability to personally discern for themselves in their context what the right thing to do was. And it ended up creating a very judgmental spirit. In contrast, you might recall that Jesus had just two rules that summed up the whole Old Testament. Do you remember what they were? Love God and love and honour your neighbour. So let's continue. They remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he looked at them again and asked, If one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. This, of course, is a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, like the previous one. The Pharisees here are arrogantly thinking that if they had a problem with an ox or a family member, of course they could bend the law a little bit and sort it out straight away. After all, they'd earned that right. But ordinary folk, they should wait till the next day. They shouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. I'm reminded of the professional golfer Tiger Woods, who during a televised speech apologised for the extramarital affairs that gained worldwide attention, that garnered him negative publicity and cost him millions of dollars in commercial sponsorships. Tiger said this, I knew my actions were wrong, but I convinced myself that normal rules did not apply. I never thought about who I was hurting. I thought I could get away with whatever. Sorry. Let's catch up here. With whatever I wanted to. I felt that I had worked hard my entire life and deserved to enjoy all the temptations around me. I felt I was entitled. He finished up, I was foolish. I don't get to play by different rules. The same boundaries that apply to everyone apply to me. I brought this shame on myself. And so now it's time for dinner. And Jesus makes an observation. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. You've got to remember that in those days, status was very important to these guys. And a very important marker of status was where you sat at the table. You think it's tough planning for a wedding and working out who sits at what table closest to the bridal party? These guys did that every time they sat down to have a meal. It mattered every time where they sat. And they were scrambling for the best positions that revealed to, the, to Jesus another layer of arrogance. They believed they deserved the highest seats. Better, they were better than those other guests. Jesus' parable went like this. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. And if so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. And then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. This is a very practical story from Jesus. There's no shuffling everybody along. You just have to go down the back of the queue. I'm reminded that the independent review into the ball tampering incident that condemned the culture of, of Cricket Australia had this to say. The broad consensus among stakeholders is that Cricket Australia does not consistently live its values and principles. Cricket Australia is perceived to say one thing and do another. The most common description of Cricket Australia is as arrogant and controlling. Well, perhaps you remember Nick Curios before this year's Australian Open. He declared himself a favourite and claimed he was ready for any pressure he will face. After one practice session at Melbourne Park, he said, I'm one of the best players in the world and so I'm definitely going into the Australian Open, any tournament with confidence. Do you remember how Nick placed in the Australian Open this year? 
He didn't stop. He pulled out. Jesus continued his parable. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all the other guests. Jesus is saying, look, if you really want to put on a big show, get the host to do it for you. Make a fuss about you. If you want a big show, go low. Jesus here is not saying nothing different to what else is already in Scripture. These Pharisees would have known their Bible. They would have known that in Proverbs 25, 6, it says, Don't put yourself forward in the king's presence. Don't take a place of honour among the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be degraded in the presence of a nobleman. Now there's a risk that you may not get noticed. And it also requires some humility to start with, that you're prepared to go low. Jesus perhaps knew that the Pharisees weren't quite up to doing that. But he finishes with a punchline that says, humility is important to God. God promises to bless and honour those people who are truly humble. Verse 11, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. God will see to it. And all those who humble themselves will be exalted. God will see to that as well. So now it's time for us to think about how this applies to us this week. And I want to make some suggestions to you this morning. The first one is that humility is not easy. A hit song by Mac Davis in 1974, that's a while ago, said this, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I keep getting better looking each day. To know me is to love me, I must be a hell of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Yep, humility is not easy. But I want to suggest to you this morning that humility makes life better. Humility is worth having. Humility will give you your best life. It will make you the best version of you that you can be. John Dixon, in his book Humilitas, subtitled A Lost Key to Life, Love and Leadership, defines humility as a noble choice to forego your status and use your influence for the good of others before yourself. In short, John says that humility is to hold power in service of others. To hold power in service of others. And John makes five points about humility. He says, first of all, humility is just common sense. If you've got some expertise in a field, you should know that there's an awful lot you don't yet know. The more you know, the more you should know that you don't know everything. And you never know who around you might have a different experience or a different perspective on the problem or the expertise area that you have. And so you should expect that others have things to teach you, particularly in the areas that you're not an expert. It's just common sense to start with humility and not arrogance. John goes on to say that humility is beautiful. It's attractive We in the West get turned off by people who are brash and arrogant and aloof. He says that humility is generative. By this he means it's a place of growth. Do you know the biggest barrier to you learning something new this week? Is the presumption that you already know it. You won't be open to new ideas and new learning if you think you already know everything. And so a little bit of humility helps you learn each day. Humility, John says, is also persuasive. We're much more willing to listen to people who are humble than people who are trying to ram ideas down our throat. And finally, humility inspires. Throughout this book, John is pressing the point that the central truth is that our reality is shaped by the cross. 
that Jesus did the most humble thing ever in willingly dying on a cross. That's power in service of others. But in case you think humility is just a Christian thing, a church thing, I want to tell you about Jim Collins, who's a corporate researcher in America. He studied a whole bunch of different companies and he was interested in those companies that stood out in their fields over other companies. Not just good companies, but truly great companies. And of course, he found one of the key ingredients was leadership. But what really stunned uh, Jim Collins was that when they looked into the leadership aspects, the two things that stood out in the leaders of those great companies were that they had a passion for the product or the cause and that they were personally humble. What mattered to them most was the product or the cause, the team and the company they'd put together to push that cause and not themselves. So a little bit of humility is a good thing to have. The third point this morning is that God honours and blesses truly humble people. So perhaps we want to look at what it means to be truly humble. Have the right kind of humility. Jesus here is not teaching about dinner etiquette, how to use a knife and fork. His lesson is about rather how to bring blessings into our lives. So we need a right understanding of how to practice humility. Now as I've pointed out before, Jesus' teaching here is consistent with other passages in scripture. For example, another proverb is Proverbs 29, 23. Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honour. And Peter, who we, we often know rushed into making bold statements and promises, later in his life he said this in one of his letters, all of you, Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but favours, but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. The NIV is a bit weak here. It should say will lift you up. It will happen in due course. Some other translations have will instead of may. And Jesus himself elsewhere said, whoever then humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we need to be sure that we have the right understanding of what humility is and what humility is not. True biblical humility is not simply self-deprecation. Oh, woe is me. I'm no good. I'm not worth anything to anybody. I ought to just die. That, my friends, is called low self-esteem. In its worst case, it's mental illness. Neither is just acting humble to camouflage your true nature. Oh, it was nothing. I was just doing my bit. But secretly, I'm saying it's about time they noticed what I did around here. Humility isn't humiliation that's imposed upon us. True humility is Holy Spirit produced. It's an outlook on life that all that I have and all that I am is because of undeserved mercy of God. And you say, well, you know, surely I played a part. It was my wording that won the bid for the company. I studied hard, I worked long hours, I put in my time, I make, my, I make smart choices. But no one controls all the small details, all the little things that help things go your way. And all the success and all the power and the privilege you have, God allowed it to happen. You might recall when we looked at Jesus' encounter with Pontius Pilate, who had the most authority of any human that he'd ever met. Jesus looked behind that earthly authority and saw God's authority. And it's the same here. Every bit of success we have is because of the hand of God. The small details that went our way. Every talent that you have. 
your experiences and how the Holy Spirit's been shaping your life and your attitudes. That's true biblical humility. Every success and benefit is because of God's gift. Paul says to the Colossians, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Truly humble people say, I don't deserve special treatment. I don't have different rules that apply to me because of any talent or success. All of what I have is given to me by God for the service of others. Do you know you can live in Griffith and be humble? Or you can live in Watson and be arrogant. You can wear a Rolex and be humble. You can wear a Timex and be arrogant. You can drive an Audi or a Porsche and still be humble. Or you can drive a beat-up Hyundai Getz and be arrogant. Humility is an inside attitude. How we see ourselves, how we relate to God, and that we understand that we're here for the service of others. The first few verses ahead of the passage that um, Aidan used this morning say this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is a pretty important passage, I think. It's really hard for us to value others above ourselves. Do you know that we judge ourselves by the intentions that we have and yet we judge others by what we see them actually doing and saying? Suppose, for example, you try to say an encouraging word to someone and it comes out a bit wrong and they get a bit miffed, hurt at you. We may not even know what we've done. But even if we did, we tend to judge ourselves by what we intended. But the hurt that we cause is felt and seen by others who judge us by our actual words and deeds. Our expectations don't always match what actually happens. And so... It's easy at times to feel more right than others. Sometimes that's correct. But often we're deluded ourselves because we have a distorted view of reality because we use our intentions as a way of judging ourselves and we yet we judge others by the acts and the words that we hear and see them do. And so Paul goes on, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. He held power in service of others. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so my last point today is that we should ask for humility. If humility is not easy, if humility makes life better, if humility brings us blessings from God if we are truly humble, then maybe we should ask for humility, ask for the Holy Spirit to work on us. But I have to warn you, if you ask for something like that from God, be ready for the answer. I don't know anybody who learnt true humility from success or winning. I think it's a challenge to remain humble when we succeed. That's good. But I doubt, I doubt that we learn much humility from our success. The process of growing in humility isn't always comfortable. As the Israelites were about to enter the promised land, Moses was summing up their time in the wilderness and he said this, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, 
whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and to thirst and to suffer plagues of snakes and illnesses and earthquakes. But through all of that, God provided for them. He provided manna to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he provided a cure of their thirst and snake bites and other things. He goes on to say, Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. I'm reminded that in Hebrews, the writer says that no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, when the time is right, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. When you get to heaven, you can ask Ruth and Esther and Moses and Joseph and David about the process of learning humility. When you ask God for the product, humility, be ready for the process that he might use to teach that to you. And so I want to finish up this morning just reminding you that the kingdom thinking is, opposite, is sometimes opposite to worldly wisdom. The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom, a topsy-turvy kingdom. And so we finish with this passage from Paul in, to the Corinthians. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things, the humble things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. In other words, your righteousness, your holiness, your redemption are because of God, not because of you. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast only in the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord God, this morning we thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Lord, we dare this morning to ask you to teach us humility this week. May your Holy Spirit be working in our hearts so that we are less proud and arrogant this week. May we not be tempted to consider ourselves better than others. Lord, we want to seek true humility. Firstly, in gratitude to you. And secondly, that we might serve others in your name. And all God's people said, Amen.